In this video, we're going to discuss a little bit about some of the different data types that we can work with, specifically characters, text, and lists of data. So I just want to continue to build on the concepts that we've talked about so far of different data types and different methods of storing this data and discuss some of the different data that you might see, things like strings and texts that are more commonly used in many different programming languages. Now, before we get started with this, I just want to point out one thing that I'm going to change uh, as we're continuing through these videos. And that is when we work in GDB, what we see is GDB by default uses a different syntax from what NASM uses for its actual x86 programming. So when we look at GDB programs, they're actually using a syntax known as AT&T syntax, and NASM is using the Intel syntax, and they differ from each other in a number of different ways. And it's easier if we can look at GDB using the Intel syntax. So for the remaining videos, I'm going to go ahead and set that using this. I'm going to say echo set disassembly flavor Intel to slash dot GDB in it like that. Now, when you do this, it's going to set it up so that it uses the Intel syntax. That way, everything is consistent from our program into GDB. And you'll see that when we test out these programs, and I'll point out some of those differences for you. Okay, so let's get into the actual programs. I'm going to start off by talking about the idea of character data. So I'm going to create my data section like I've done before, and I'm going to go ahead and define something called care. It's going to be a byte, and it's going to have the value A in single quotes like this. So this is a single character. And it's interesting to work with characters in assembly languages because they work in a slightly different way from what you would see in a normal programming language. So we're going to see some interesting components of this as we start to work with it. And just to help to demonstrate that, what we'll do is I'll just go ahead and create our simple program as we've been sort of doing throughout these videos. We'll set up our start label. I'll move into, uh, let's say, BL, the value of care. And then I'll move uh, EAX1 and we'll interrupt with ADH. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go ahead and I'm going to assemble and I'm going to run this. And I'm going to show you what the result is. So let's go ahead and do that. So we're going to say um, NASM elf o, uh, we'll do data.o, data.s, and I'll do LD for elf i386, data, data.o. There we go. And I'm just going to go ahead and run data, and I'm going to echo out the exit code, and you'll see that I get the value 65. Now, if you aren't too familiar with low-level programming and sort of the way that things are stored, 65 may seem like a sort of weird result. Let's talk a little bit about that. What happens is when we work with anything in a low-level language, it's stored as numeric data, specifically as binary data. So really when we're like abstracting completely down to the hardware level, everything is binary. It's really electrical switches turning on and off. So when we want to store something like the character A, your computer doesn't have some explicit way of storing specifically A. What it does instead is it encodes that value in a way that it has a numeric value that represents that letter. And there's a few different encodings that exist. ASCII is one of them. And uh, there's a few others like a Unicode, for example, that can deal with larger sets of values. And basically what happens is in all of these encodings, a specific number is assigned to every single letter and symbol that can possibly be displayed. So in this case, 65 represents the capital letter A. So when you work with letters in assembly languages, you're going to see them represented as numbers. So it's helpful to keep in mind this idea. If you ever want to figure out what number represents what letter, you can just look up the ASCII encoding and take a look at that. That will help you with these x86 programs. Um, so you'll be able to see like 65 goes to A, uh, 66 goes to B, and that sequence continues on with the capital letters. And then the lowercase letters get their own numbers as well, and then so do all the different symbols, and you'll see those as you continue to work with them. So that's the first concept that I want you to understand is that um, we don't store these as letters, we store them as numbers. The numbers represent the letters. And you'll see that when we work with things like uh, C programs and this sort of idea, what happens is it's able to translate these numbers into letters to display them on the screen. And that's the process that goes through when we get up to these higher level languages. But just keep in mind, all of these are gonna be numbers when we're working with them in our actual programs. 
So that's the first thing that I wanted to mention. The second thing that I want to show you is the idea of lists of values. So you can define like lists of values, like a one, two, three, four, like this. It's very simple. You just separate them with commas and every single one of these will be a, uh, a byte in size since we're defining it as a byte. So I'm just going to change the name of this to list just so that it's a little bit more fitting. And uh, what we'll do is we'll change this here to list. And what I really want to show you is I want to show you what this looks like in memory when we store data like this. So let's go ahead and do that. So we'll just go ahead and go through our same uh, assemble and uh, LD here. And I'm going to GDB this now. So GDB data. And we'll change the layout to ASM. I'll break at start and then I will run. And taking a look at the syntax now, you can see the difference between the Intel and AT&T. You can see that this matches way closer to what we have in our program. You see that we're moving like one into EAX, for instance, before it had like the percent sign to represent the register. And I think even the operations were flipped. I think typically in, uh, in uh, AT&T, it's flipped compared to Intel. So this is a bit easier to read. Um, don't get too concerned about this byte pointer DS uh, 804A000. You can see the address still there, right? The 804A000. Uh, byte pointer just means that it's a byte in size and that the address is pointing to a piece of data in memory. If you're familiar with C programming, you'll know the idea of pointers. Pointers are variables that point to a value. And that's what this is doing. It's, it's an address that points to a value in memory. So that's sort of the way that that works. The main things that we want to see here is if I do x over x of 0x804A000, is the list of values that I stored. And you can see that they're all stored sequentially, much in the way of me defining like two separate variables, right? We have a four, three, two, one. So that's, that's the way that that is set. Now, what's interesting about this, it's something that I sort of want to get you thinking about is when we're looking at memory sort of around this, you'll see that um, most of memory is going to be initialized to zero, but sort of an interesting idea here is that we don't really know how big this list is in memory, uh, mostly that we don't know where the list actually ends, right? We don't really have much of a reliable way of knowing where this list is going to end when we're working with it in memory. And this becomes a really interesting problem in x86. What you want to do when you're declaring a list, just to give you some intuition here, is you always want to have something that indicates the end of the list. So suppose that I was working with positive values. Something that I could do is I could put like a negative one at the end of it to indicate that that's the end of this list. And basically if I ever want to go through this list, I could say keep going until I reach that negative one and I know that that is the end of the list. I could explicitly put a zero if I know that zeros won't be in that list. But really the main idea here is that you need something at the end of the list that indicates that this is the end of the list. We typically refer to this as a null terminator. It tells us where the list has ended. So that way we actually know where to stop iterating. And this is a concept that we'll, we'll get more into as we continue to discuss more complex concepts. I just want you to start thinking about that idea of there has to be an end to this list. And the reason why I want you to think about that is because when we work with strings, which I'll show you here right now, that concept becomes important as well. So we get to find lists or strings, which are really just lists of characters. So I can have like a string that's like a ABA, right? That is a string of text. And like I said before, we need to indicate some ending point for this string. Now with strings, it becomes a little bit easier than when we're working with like lists of numbers, for instance. There's a defined way of ending this string, which is to put a zero like this. This is again called a null terminator. If you've ever worked in C, you'll understand this idea quite well. So we have this null terminator that indicates the end of the string. And that way we actually know where the string ends and where the next set of data begins. Now, just to demonstrate this to you, let's call this string one. And I'm going to declare another string two, which I'm going to call, um, we'll say C, D, E, let's say, make it nice and distinguishable. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to load um, string one just so that we can get the address of it easily. So let's say string one here. Let me show you what the memory actually looks like when we do this. And this will give you a bit more of an understanding towards why we actually do this. So we'll say layout ASM, I'll break at start and then we'll run. 
So what I want to show you is, um, let's get three memory slots here. Um, 0x804a000. Now look at each of these strengths here. So first off, okay, 41, 42, 41. 41 is the hex representation, right? So because I'm working in hex right now, 41 is 65, right? So just uh, get it to the habit of converting between hex and decimal with these ASCII values. Uh, it'll be a little bit tricky at first, but you'll get used to that. So 41, 42, 41 is my first string. And then notice the zeros before we get to 45, 44, 43. 45, 44, 43 is the next string in the sequence, right? That's the um, C, D, E string. The zero indicates that the first string, A, B, A, has ended, right? Do you see how that zero sort of creates a division in memory between the first string and the second string? It gives a defined ending point, so we know actually where that data ended. If I didn't put that zero, the 45 would appear where the zeros are now. And if I were trying to go through the first string, it'd be 41, 42, 41, and then I'd hit 45. I don't know if 45 is a character in the string or if it's a new string, right? So you can see how that problem is created if we don't have that null terminator. We don't know where one slot of memory ends and the other one begins. So these are some things that we want to keep in mind as we continue to work with memory. But at this point, you have a pretty good understanding now of the different types of memory, the different values that we can store in memory. And now you should feel a bit more comfortable working with the various different components of memory. So thank you for watching this video. In the next video, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk to you a bit about uninitialized data. Rather than initializing data, we can actually write uninitialized data. So that would be an important component to talk about next. And then we can talk about some different uh, ideas and start talking about different instructions and getting away from data storage for a little bit to do a little bit more x86 programming. So I'll see you in the next video.